Now, Sports Talk with Broads. Here's Hunter Brody. There you have it. The Sixers fall in Orlando. Joel Embiid did not play. It was the second half of a back-to-back. I don't care if Joel Embiid was in the mix or not. In Orlando, against a team that was 3-7 and seven entering the night, this Sixers roster is way too talented to lose that basketball game. And the way that it happened, come on now. To blow up in the fourth quarter, to turn the ball over at an insane rate, for players to continue to miss wide open shots, it's unacceptable. It really is. This team is struggling to find any sort of rhythm from the perimeter, and it's just so annoying. Now, before we dive into this a little bit more, do not forget that I can give you free money. Use the promo code BROGE when you are buying tickets at SeatGeek's checkout page and you receive a free $20. It's a no-brainer. You get to enjoy yourself at the game, you get to save money, and you can use that money for a beer, for a sandwich, for a water, whatever you want to do. It's a no-brainer. Use the promo code BROGE. It's okay to have concern right now. I just don't think it's time to throw in the towel. And this is why I believe that. Tobias Harris, Al Horford, Josh Richardson, not the greatest couple of games shooting the basketball. But if you look throughout their career, statistically, they have a good track record. Josh Richardson can shoot a really good clip from three. Tobias Harris before Philadelphia was shooting over 40%. Al Horford, I don't think he's going to go two of eight from three most nights. My point is this, and I'll use J.J. Redick as an example. We know how great J.J. Redick is from three. When he shoots it and when he releases it, you think that's going in. Because he's done it for so long. So if there was an 11-game stretch where J.J. Redick shot 27% from three, you would think as a fan, well, there's no way that's going to stay like that. There's no way he's not going to get out of that funk eventually. But that's what I'm sitting here thinking about the Sixers. Like, that's how I'm thinking about the Sixers. There's no way Tobias Harris is going to go 0 for 11, 0 for 3, and then continue to go 0 for 8, 0 for 7, 0 for 9, 0 for 10 from 3 throughout the next couple games. There's just no way. He's too talented. He is. It's all mental right now. He's in this obnoxious funk, this brutal funk. He finished with 8 points and only made 4 shots in 13 attempts. It's been bad. The last few games for Tobias Harris, it makes you question the decision on, on paying him, but... Let's be real. There's no way anyone could see this much of a drop-off happening. And I can't believe, I can't sit here and tell you that this is going to be how Tobias Harris will play for the rest of his career, for the rest of the max contract. He's too good of a player. He's just lost right now mentally. And the only way to figure it out, really, is to see shots go in. Early in the basketball game, you saw him run off the three-point line a couple times, and he was moving his feet towards the basket, and he was putting the ball in. It just died out from there, and he wasn't able to succeed, and late, he was bad. Bad, 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 bad. Bad might even be an understatement. He had a couple turnovers, which led the big-time transition points for for the Magic. Actually, they weren't even in transition because it was an offensive foul with a push-off, and then there was a travel call, so it wasn't in transition. But on the other side, you had the Magic. It was Fournier hit a three, and before that, it was Terrence Ross hit a three. And those were crucial minutes in the fourth quarter that did not help the Sixers whatsoever. So late, Tobias Harris was bad. But here's something that bothers me as a whole. Deep into the game. We're talking late third quarter. The Sixers had one free throw. One free throw. Now, when you look at the end of the game, Tobias Harris had zero. Ben Simmons had zero. Come on. You got to get fouled. You got to find a way to get to the charity stripe at some point here. Now, Ben Simmons, I thought, had a pretty good game. Defensively, he was great, which led to a lot of fast breaks for him, and he had some monster dunks. I didn't think Ben Simmons had a bad game at all. He finished with 18, 8, and 5. But going back to the free throws, even when we did eventually later in the basketball game get to the free throw line, the Sixers shot under 70%. 
So it is a consistent theme now that they are not even knocking down their free throws. Now that's on these players, the individual talent to go up to the free throw line and to sink the shots. They're not doing anything right at the moment. 15 turnovers. And like I stated, the late ones killed the team. I'm not specific on the time that this occurred, but I remember the broadcast, a la Mark Zumoff, mentioned, oh, this is the Sixers' eighth turnover. And I remember looking at the clock. I was impressed. Wow, only eight turnovers this late in the game? But the Sixers end up with 15. So from that moment on, they consistently found ways to give the ball to the other team. Whether it was a bad pass, or an offensive foul, or a travel. And it was a problem. The team is terrible in terms of shooting the ball right now. Even Furkan Korkmaz had a bad game. In 28 minutes, he knocked down one three-pointer. I've mentioned this so many times for Furkan Korkmaz to play minutes and for him to be available for this team and for him to find himself on the court, he needs to knock shots down because he's not a great defender, because he's lost defensively. He doesn't have the footwork to keep up with some of these guys. The only way for him to consistently get on the floor is to knock down shots. He did not have his best performance in this game. Now, he's farthest from the problem right now, but he wasn't strong in Orlando. Obviously, the big headline is Tobias Harris looks lost. He just does. It's that simple. He has no clue what to do because he's so lost mentally. He has zero confidence. You can see him hesitate when he gets the ball. He doesn't want to shoot from three right now. But reality is... How else do you get out of this mess other than continuing to shoot it? I think if you're Brett Brown, you need to look at the fact that the team barely got to the free throw line. And when they did, they weren't making it. But I think you need to realize, deep into the third quarter, you went to the line once. We need to get to the line way more. Now, Joel Embiid will help that. I know all the old school fans, Joel Embiid has to live under the basket. Why is he back out of the perimeter so much? It's 2019. This is how basketball works. Look at all the big men in this league. There are plenty of times where Joel Embiid lives under the basket and gets fouled and goes to the free throw line 18 times. There's also times where he shoots from the perimeter. You can argue right now that he might be our best three-point shooter outside of Furkan Korkmaz, so he has to live out there. It's 2019. You live, you live outside, and you live by the three, even if you're a big man. So I, I don't get all pissed off that he's out on the perimeter for some points of games. It's just what it is these days. You need to realize that you need to adapt with the times. I thought off the bench there were two players that stood out to me. James Ennis, specifically in the first half, 10 points, provided spark. And, and he was definitely solid. And Kyle O'Quinn, he had five assists in his 15 minutes. I thought that was one hell of a snag by Elton Brand. I didn't really know what to expect out of Kyle O'Quinn when we first signed him. But he has been very impressive in my opinion. And can play a pretty decent role for this team. Specifically, I would say, throughout the regular season. Once playoff minutes happen, you never really know. And, you know, that's way farther down the road that I even need to think about. The Sixers are 7-4. and four. It's not where we wanted to be. You squeak one out against Cleveland that you shouldn't have won, and you fall in Orlando. It's not pretty. There's no denying that it's not pretty. But we're also not 4-7, and seven, right? We're, we're not 4-7. and seven. We're not 3-8. and eight. We're not 2-10. and ten. We're 7-4. and four. Things are sloppy. Things are bad right now. The spacing is a problem. There's no rhythm right now with the basketball team. There's also, what, 71 more games? Plenty of time to figure this out. Like I stated, the track record of these players, they're good players. They are. Their numbers individually are way better than what they are right now with the Sixers. So I'm playing the averages here. I'm thinking these players I've seen shoot a specific average in this league. At some point, it will find itself. And at some point... 
it will all play itself out. Here's the thing, because I got a couple buddies that text me so emotional after the game. This team stinks. Ben Simmons, horrendous. I can't stand this team. Joel Embiid, load management. What a pathetic joke. And, and they all freak out after the loss. And then after a win, they're so pumped. And it's just an emotional roller coaster with some of my buddies. And I embrace it. I laugh. It is what it is. In January, if the Sixers go on a six-game, seven-game win streak, everything changes. People feel good about the team. It's uglier than any of us would have expected it to be. And like I stated, it's okay to have concern. But I I also think some deep breaths need to be taken. There's a ton of emotional people on Sixers Twitter and just so reactionary after every little game that happens. I think 25 games in is a good number. 25 26, 27, 28 games. That's a good sample size. It's so weird. Everyone reacts to every little game. And listen, I I do every single game on YouTube. But to really know what this team is, I think we need more of a sample size. Everyone's answer now when I say, well, we're just 7 and 4. Let's calm down. We're not 5 and 12. The answer is always, well, I see this. I see what this team is. I see what they're going to be in the playoffs. I know they can't shoot. I know they're going to struggle in the playoffs. There's no way they can win the Eastern Conference. Overlooking the regular season just ruins everything. If you're going to have that type of mindset, then don't watch and then turn the TV on in April and May and watch then. Just watch the playoffs and just see what the team is then. Don't embrace the journey. Don't embrace the time where the team develops who they are. Don't watch it. Just turn it on during the playoffs. Because I'm intrigued by the the growth. I'm intrigued by what Brett Brown's going to do. The rotations. When Tobias Harris steps up. Matisse Thibel's growth. Al Horford being the dad that plays at LA Fitness and being the leader. I'm intrigued by how this team is going to figure out the problem and how they're going to grow as a unit. I want to embrace that journey. I want to go on the ride with the team. Absolutely, it's painful at times, and it will be, and this won't be the last disgusting game we watch. But have some faith. It, it's not It's not being a fan that has zero clue on what's going on to think that they can turn it around. The track record, once again, That is the moral of the story here. The track record will help you prove that they can turn it around because these players have played better than this for long periods of time individually. Josh Richardson, I would say, wasn't great, insane. He wasn't bad either. He had 19 points. Let's get to Markel Fultz because it was his, his... First game against the Sixers. He looked exactly the same. A couple nice plays where he shows his athleticism. He does a spin move. He ends up showing his length. He takes it to the basket hard. And then his threes came where the hitch in his shot is still there. Awful attempts. I mean awful. They looked worse than maybe before. Nah, I'm being a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a jerk off there. It definitely wasn't to that degree. But, they look the same. Markel Fultz looks exactly the same. You'll see tiny little bits of, whoa, that was a nice play. Whoa, he's athletic. And other times, what is going on? The shot is not fixed. And I'm a firm believer in, there's no actual injury. It's all up here. Markel Fultz, to me, is a hate the face. I can't stand him. I'm not rooting for him to succeed. I'm not. I know he's a young kid. I get it. He had a lot of pressure. It's the NBA. It is what it is. I can't stand him. He is a hate the face. I can't stand looking at him. Some athletes have that on me. Some athletes just rub me the wrong way. He's one of them. It's probably great for him to be in a market like Orlando that's nowhere close to Philadelphia when the fans don't care, the media is barely there. It's probably the best for him mentally. But get away from my face. He's a hate the face. 
And believe it or not, at 97.3 ESPN, I work with a couple guys that are so intrigued by Fultz. One is a Fultz lover, and I mean lover. Watches all of his games, super pumped. The other one just really enjoys the storyline, and it intrigues him. There's a difference. One retweets every time he makes a jump shot in practice, (laughs) which is funny because I did that with Ben Simmons, but it's a different level. He retweets every time a beat reporter says something great about him. Just retweets everything. I can't even stand it. The other one is just so interested in the story and finds it fascinating. I can't stand the kid. All right? It's just that simple. I can't stand him. I think he's a fraud. We'll move on. (laughs) MCW. Michael Carter Williams. We're talking rookie of the year. What a joke. And he ends up getting 11 points in 14 minutes off the bench for the Magic. What a joke. And you know Vucevic was going to have a good day because he always has a good day against the Sixers. No Joel Embiid played a factor in that, but he had 25 and 12. And Gordon's knocking down threes. Aaron Gordon, of all people, he had 18 and 13 with a big night. Why not, though? Just why not? Of course. Of course. The team is going to have to really dig deep. See, I always figured it would be ugly because of the style of defense that the Sixers were going to play. And I knew the offense was going to be on the uglier side. We weren't going to score 140 points a night and hold the other teams to 95. It was going to be tough, hard-nosed defense, ugly offense, but because your D was so great, it would create more opportunities to score. We are now seeing that that is the case, but the offense is way uglier than we could have ever imagined. Can it be fixable? People have to step up and and make their shots. It comes down to that. I know a lot of fans are so pissed off. We have no shooting at all. I think we have better shooting than people are saying we do. Josh Richardson can knock down a better percentage from three. Tobias Harris definitely can. Al Horford can be better than two of eight. Ben Simmons, yeah, he might have a problem. Furkan, he can have a better day than he did in Orlando. Mike Scott, he could probably knock down more than what he did in this ballgame. It's not good. I'm just saying it's not as bad as what some of the fans are saying because of how emotional they are and how disappointed they are in the start of the season. It, it's disappointing. I'd be lying if I said it's not disappointing that we're 7-4. and four. It's just not time to say it's all over, we stink, throw away the rest of the season. If that's your mindset, then like I stated, do not watch any more of the season and turn it on in April. Turn it on then. You can be frustrated, but I also think you need to understand that there's logic behind it. There's 71 more basketball games. There's not 15, 18, 71 more basketball games. I don't think the sample size is out there. The sample size isn't to where we need it to be. 25 games, 26, 27, 28, in that range, we'll know more fully of what this team is. Now, if it's the same way, then we'll have to address it from there and and figure it the hell out. Do I think Brett Brown can, can maybe switch some things up to give people different looks to try something new? Absolutely. And I think you'll see that. All right, well, there you have it. The Sixers fall in Orlando. They got to come up with a new game plan. They got to figure it out. They got to come together as a team and really dig deep, find a way to get a victory on Friday. It's that simple. No one's going to feel sorry for them. Seven and four. Find ways to win ball games. Find ways to get rhythm. Find ways to hit your shots. These are open looks. It comes down to the players finding their shots because they're open. They are available. And these players have knocked them down at a higher rate before. That's the weird part. Maybe it's just the pressure coming into the season. It's the pressure knowing that there were these high expectations. Is it similar to the Boston Celtics thing that happened last year? It's possible. It's possible. 
Thank you guys so much for watching. Hit that thumbs up button and subscribe. See you next time.